a regular Army Combat Arms Officer, Assistant Professor at Fordham University. He completed graduate studies at various universities in international relations and homeland security. He authors America Today, the, the America Today column, published on the Nolan chart. He authored three books and lectures nationwide. He's credited as the originator of the Department of Defense Cold War Veterans Certificate of Recognition, passed by Congress and signed into law by President Bill Clinton. Uh, there are index cards as, as announced on the table for you to write your questions. Uh, we'll start taking cards up around 12.45. So get your questions ready and please turn off your cell phones and give your good attention to our guest, Mark Bowden. Mark Bowden. Everybody hear me? Yes. Oh, good. I'm going to get in a lot of trouble because I don't use these. <laughs> Somebody should have told me ahead of time we could have done something about it, but I don't use it. I move around too much, so if they're going to try to film it, that ain't going to work either. So, and I'm not doing it to be disrespectful. What I'm doing it for is because, to me, communications isn't just my voice, but it's my hands, it's my body, it's my face, it's everything that God can use to communicate to you. So I'm sorry, I apologize to the technicians, but this is who I am. Somebody had told me in advance we would have had to work on it a little bit. Um, I really appreciate the invitation for today. I, I, I can't tell you how much this invitation meant. And it, and it started with David Pearson, who I worked with on the Kim Ford Historical Association. And it came through Ashton Orvitz, who I didn't realize was a Citadel graduate, but I'm very proud to know that. Um, and, and we started talking months back about what, what would it be that I would talk about. And I'm a real, I am a real believer in God. And I don't mean it. Yeah. The best way to tell you is I think I'm standing here right now, speaking to you right now, because that's what God wants me to do. Amen. And so I worked on my presentation for a long period of time. It is written out. David Pearson has a copy of it. I could also email it to you if you want it. Um, so it, because what I'm going to talk to you about today, in my view, is why Mitt Romney lost the election. Why did the Republicans lose? That's what today's talk is about. But it's in the context of foreign policy and what is America. And what's going to happen is, I'm going to move back and forth. I'm going to move speaking to you as I am, and then I'm going to move where I'm just reading to you from what I wrote. And the reason I'm going to do that is I spent literally, and I'm not exaggerating here, weeks preparing what I'm going to say to you. And some of the things that I wrote down, I won't remember them like I wrote. So I'm going to have to just read to you, and if you don't like it, go to sleep. <laughs> but, but the message is extremely important. Um, before I get started, there are some homework things I have to do. First of all, I want to thank Patty and Alan and Bob. And this, or this group made it very simple for me when I got here. I had a lot of stuff to do in a very short amount of time, and they helped me get that done so I could be ready to talk to you. And I really appreciate that. I have spoke across the country in a lot of places, and I've never been taken care of like I was when I got here as far as helping me to get ready. Patty, thank you very much, wherever you are. Um, <laughs> one of the things on your table is um, a, a magazine from the MVETS, which is the fourth largest veterans organization in the United States. And this, it, think about when I, I was talking about God. And if you look at this, and I forget the year on this, and so my eyes are very bad. It might be 70, or it might be 90, 97. Okay, this was published in 1997. It's on your table in 2012. Who intended that? Only one other being could think like that. And so that's why I said, and these are the last of them. I don't have any more of these. This is it. Now, the reason I brought it was because 
We're going to talk about some very complex things today. And I mean they are really complicated. This is not easy stuff. So if you, get, if, if you can't hang with me or if I'm doing a very bad job of communicating, don't feel bad if you get up and walk out. Because it's that complicated. This is not easy. I want to ask a question. Are there any people in this room born before 1975? If you were, stand up. <laughs> Okay, please sit down. That leaves us with an extremely important but small group here today, which is everybody born after 1975. Please stand up. You were born after 1975. Go ahead and sit down. This is, today's talk is really more for you than it is for anybody else, those born after 1975. Because what we're going to talk about today is what will the Republican Party, why, why do we keep losing? And what do we have to do to start winning? And it really goes back to ancient history for you, which for us, we lived through, and it's called the Cold War. Now, that you may have noticed above me, um, Bob, right? Yeah, Alan, 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 Alan. Alan's helping me out here. I have brought overheads for you to look at through the Cold War, and he's going to be putting them up. I am not a college professor. I do not read <laughs> overheads to my people. If you can't read them or you don't like them, just pass them by. But you're going to get communicated at from a lot of different ways at the same time, and pick what you like. But what I want to talk about first is, is the Cold War. Well, let's, let's first talk about, um, I gotta get to it now. Hold on a second. Okay. Why did Romney lose? I'll begin to talk with the question. In 1943, Walter Lippmann wrote, quote, in foreign relations, as in all other relations, a policy has been formed only when the commitments and power have been brought into balance. In other words, what Walter Lippmann is saying is you can't have a policy unless you can do it. You could say something, but it isn't a policy until it happens. So in, in what he's saying is extremely important. <laughs> This nation's recent focus on our federal government's fiscal imbalance has clearly made it impossible to seriously consider a foreign policy for the post-Cold War United States. America has not defined itself to the American people in the post-Cold War. In other words, what I'm trying to say there is, for those born after 1975, I'm not exactly sure that you know what an American is, as opposed to all of us that were born before 1975. You see, when I was born, America, there wasn't another country on the planet. There was not another country on this planet that could hold our coat. We were it. Out there, please. I'm trying. <laughs> I mean, I, what I said was that there wasn't another country on this planet that could hold our coat. <laughs> and it wasn't because we had braggarts, and it wasn't because we wanted to be the ruler of the world. It was because God called us and we came. And it started with uh, December 7, 1941, when World War II started, and America was drawn into World War II. America did not want to go to war. They had to be dragged into it like they had to be dragged into it in World War I. America was about Americans, not anybody else. We didn't really care what went on across the pond. We didn't really care what was going on in the Pacific. What we cared about was what was going on in Thailand. 
what was going on in wherever you're from. That's what we cared about. But we didn't really care about being a nation that was ruler of the world or leader of the free world or whatever you want to call it. That really wasn't what America was about. And what happened was when World War II started, we got drawn into that fight. And because we had taken care of ourselves and our nation, we, were, we had the potential to be the most powerful nation on the planet, bar none, and won World War II. From that, Harry Truman and those people around him decided that we didn't want to be drawn into another world war. That it was our job on behalf of God and the rest of the world to try to create a world where there could be peace. Now the problem was for us was that even before World War II started, the devil had already planted a seed in the Soviet Union called socialism and communism. And so when World War II ended, you had two ideologies on the world that were in direct confrontation. One was communism and socialism, and the other one was democracy and capitalism. And they faced off like two tigers or two lions looking right at each other. And it was one of us is going to survive and one of us isn't. And that's really where the Cold War came from. But God was there to make sure that it didn't turn into World War III. And the way he did that, in a way, at least in my view, there's going to be people in this room that are just going to hate me at the end of everything I say today. But the way he did that was give us a weapon that could destroy the world, a nuclear bomb. And so because we had a nuclear bomb and they had a nuclear bomb, it was like, I want to kill you, but I'm not going to do it because you'll kill me. And so what ended up happening was a face-off. What ended up happening was two huge world systems facing each other, and they had to find a way to kill each other, but they couldn't shoot at each other. And so what happened was a completely new type of warfare that never existed before and may not ever exist again. But it was called the Cold War. And the Cold War is a very under, misunderstood, never talked about, never really explained um, event in history that dominated 50 years of the world. And for the kids, they, I don't know how they teach it in school, but I can tell you this. It so dominated our lives that when I was younger than you and in class, they would sound an alarm and we would crawl under our desks. It was so dominant that they would sound an alarm and we would clear the room, go out the hall and put our hands in our head against the wall because somebody was dropping a nuclear bomb. That actually happened to me and probably to a number of people in this room. And we, we, we were, as a nation, in constant fear that we might not be here the next second. Because once an engagement started with nuclear weapons, you couldn't stop. And once it started, everything was gone. Now, the Cold War had violent parts to it. I'm going to take my coat off, folks, because it's warm. We had violent parts in the Cold War. The first one was the war my dad fought in, which was the Korean War. The second one was a war called Vietnam, Vietnam that many people misunderstand. They, many people, even Vietnam veterans, don't really understand that Vietnam was a strategic success for the United States during the Cold War. Most people won't stand up and tell you that because they're afraid of the mainstream media and the liberals telling you they're nuts. Whoever's saying that is nuts. They're crazy. We surrendered. Well, let me ask you a question. Being Texans in this room, was the Alamo a victory for the war for independence of Texas, or was it a defeat? Victory. It was a victory because it bought time for Sam Houston to put his army together to kick somebody's butt. Well, Vietnam was exactly the same thing. Vietnam was the Alamo of the Cold War because what it did was force the Soviet Union, our main antagonist, to concentrate all its forces, ideas, intellect, money, into Vietnam. Now, they weren't there with their tanks. 
and it wasn't us fighting Soviets, but it was us fighting Soviet money. It was us fighting Soviet technology. It was us fighting Soviet resources being directed there, and they didn't go anywhere else. When we went to Vietnam, the argument was by John Kennedy and Eisenhower and Lyndon Johnson that if we needed to be in Vietnam because of the domino effect, they said that once we left Vietnam, other countries in the world would fall to communism. What happened when we left Vietnam? The domino effect happened. The communists went into Cambodia, they went into Laos. They went into South America, Honduras, El Salvador, and other nations. They went into Grenada, they went into Africa, and they went into Afghanistan. So everything that was predicted about what would happen if we left Vietnam happened. But it happened 13 years after it was predicted. Long enough for America to get smart and finally elect a man who knew what he was doing, Ronald Reagan. Imagine if we had pulled out of Vietnam at the beginning, in 64, instead of in 75. We wouldn't, there would not be the world that we have today. The entire world history would have changed had there not been a Vietnam. Are there any veterans in the room who served between 1945 and 1991 if you are in the room, please stand up. 1945 to 1994. How many times, how many times in your lifetime have you heard anybody recognize the people who freed the world? Because that's what those people did. I just want to finish up on the Cold War, but I want to, the reason I'm doing this, folks, is we've got to start somewhere so I can go somewhere. And the Cold War is the place to start. Because from the Cold War, it's everything after that that we're going to talk about. But when you talk about the Cold War, there's things that people don't tell you. For example, when did the Cold War begin? Well, when I worked on the legislation to create that certificate to honor the Cold War vets, that was not an easy question to, to determine. There was no Fort Sumter. And we actually had to try to sort out through history when did the Cold War begin? Because some historians actually think the Cold War began around the World War I period when the United States actually invaded Russia because of the, of the communist revolution. We came into Russia on the white side against the reds. And so some historians will say, that's when the Cold War started. But the problem with that is, how do you stand up and tell people, we were in the middle of the Cold War in 1920, but the Russians were our allies in World War II? That doesn't make any sense at all. So what we had to do was try to make something that made sense when you talked historically. And what we picked was the Japanese surrender in September of 1945 as the beginning of the Cold War. Because the tensions between America and the Soviet Union were already existed and the competition already existed. If you watch the movie Patton, you see it right there in front of your face when they talk about who's going to take Berlin. Or when the war is over and Patton says, let's finish it right now. Let's get it over with right now. Now, I love George Patton, but he was wrong in that case. Anyway, but th those are some examples that will show you that the Cold War existed instantaneously as the World War II ended. And so the beginning of the Cold War was 1945. Now, when did it end? Well, some people picked the fall of the Berlin Wall. But that's not accurate because that's 1988, and a couple years later, the Soviet Union, which still existed, invaded the Baltic countries of Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania, and we almost went to war with them, so Guess what? 1988 doesn't work. The day we selected for the end of the Cold War was Christmas Day, 1991. And the reason we picked Christmas Day, 1991, is because that's the last day of the Soviet Union. Its flag went up on the Kremlin in the morning of Christmas, its flag came down on the night of Christmas, and it never went up again. And so from now, when we tried to get that through Congress, they would not pick Christmas Day. 
So it became December 26th by American law. Interesting that they would avoid Christ's birthday. But that's exactly what happened. Now the problem for us was when the Cold War ended, we lost our identity as a nation. You see, during my entire lifetime, from 1955 until 1991, America was defined as the leader of the free world. How many times did we hear that term? I mean, it was like, I'm a Texan. Or it was like, I'm a Cowboys fan. I mean, it just was. It existed. We were the leader of the free world. And it dominated everything. When you, I, I gotta finish this part. Um, the Cold War was so important, you can't imagine it. But let me tell you, you wouldn't have an interstate highway system if there wasn't a Cold War. It would not exist. It was proposed by Dwight D. Eisenhower as a defensive tool to be able to move forces from the East Coast to the West Coast. That's why the interstate system was built. That was the Cold War. We would not have landed on the moon if there had not been a Cold War. That was done when John F. Kennedy, and God bless him for doing it, said we will go to the moon in the next decade. It wouldn't have happened without that competition. And so when God puts us in competition, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. Because look at the things that have come out of it. But now when the Cold War ends, it's kind of like when you're in high school and you're the star quarterback and you graduate. Now what? Did you peek out? Is that it? Is life over? I, I, that's my best day is the day we won the state championship. That's it. I'm done. I'm 18. I'm done. And that's where America is in trouble today. And that's why Romney lost, and it's why the Republicans won't win until they figure this out. And they're not even asking the questions. Have you ever heard any public speaker tell you what the Cold War was, when it was? No. And have you ever heard any public speaker say, who are we? No. That is so huge. If you look at, if you look at President Obama, there is no doubt who he thinks America is and what it should be. It should be a socialist country. It should be kind of like some kind of utopia where if you need milk or you need to go to the hospital or you need a house or you need a car, you go to the government. I mean, I, I, this boy missed the Soviet Union, chapter on the Soviet Union because they tried that. It did not work. It fails. That system failed. The greatest evidence of the failure of communism is the People's Republic of China. The People's Republic of China at 1.6 billion people is five times larger than the United States. But they don't even have the gross domestic product that we do and they're five times larger than we are. So how are they going to get bigger economically than the United States? Easy answer, capitalism. My brother, who works for a Fortune 500 company, has been to China four times in the last two years where 40 factories were built by an American company in China. They will have a larger economy than ours within the next four years. And they will be a mega power not a superpower. They will make us look like kindergarten. If they, can, if they can accept the systems that we are currently rejecting, freedom and capitalism. Now from their side, they're coming from a, from a, a place where there's no freedom. So if they give a little bit of freedom, well, heck, that's a lot better than it was, and everybody feels good about it. In America, where we, we had almost complete freedom, we are taking it away 
every day by taking money out of people's pocket. And I don't mean that as a, I'm not saying I'm against taxes, but what I am saying is that there's a place for that. It's like everything else. How much money do you spend on your car? How much money do you spend on your house? How much money do you spend on your kids? There's only so much. And that's what the government has to get used to. You only get so much. Then you don't get any more. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. End of mission. Good night. Yeah. And that's where our problem is, is while they're moving this way to the right, we're moving this way to the left. Now, we are, now if their left is so good, how come they're moving this way? If it's so great to be communist, how come the Soviet Union lost? They had the same stuff we did. They were bigger than we are. It's because the system does not work. And part of that, and, and here's, you know, God bless Mitt Romney for, for what I saw. I don't know if I would call him a Christian because, I, to be honest with you, I'm confused on what Mormonism is. What I saw was Christian. What I saw was a man who gave of himself to take care of people. What I didn't hear was, I'm a Christian. And that's one of the biggest things that we missed this election. When, when Barack Obama went out and said, we're not a Christian nation, the overwhelming chorus of America should have been, we are, you're out. That's what it should have been. But the Republican Party didn't do it. Nobody with the exception of Sarah Palin, do I ever hear stand up and say, I'm a Christian. <clears throat> that should be the first word out, not the last word out. <laughs> try, guys, I'll be all over the place, so you, I'm, I'm going to have to try to bring myself back to where I'm supposed to go. After, as the Cold War was ending, and remember how fast that happened? For you guys, you can't imagine it. You cannot imagine what it's like to every day be fearful that a nuclear war could start. And then all of a sudden, gone. That's how fast it happened. It happened that fast. No one could predict it. No one sat down. Anybody in here here on the news, one of those really wise news people say, well, you know, in about three years, the Soviet Union will fall apart. I don't remember that. Somewhere I don't even remember tomorrow the Soviet Union will fall apart. It just happened. Nobody could predict it because God did it. We didn't do it. But what I'm saying is when that happened, there were everybody in the foreign policy world was like, oh my God, what do we do now? You know, our entire system within the world was set up on the Cold War and that confrontation and all of a sudden, not there. It would be like if gravity stopped now. And we all started to float. And we go, uh-oh, what is this? What are we doing now? Well, that's exactly what it was like. It was exactly like that. And so something had to come in and fill the void. And what came to fill the void, very quietly, without you knowing anything about it, was a group that wants a one world government. And they had started way back with the League of Nations. That group is not a young group. That's not like, well, they didn't have anything to do, so they got together down at the barbershop Tuesday and they came up. They've been doing this for almost a century now, and they're going to continue on it. And their way for trying to get to that point is what you call globalism. Now, I'm calling it globalism. If you look it up in the computer, you're going to have to look up globalization, not globalism, because they won't recognize the word globalism. The reason I say globalism is because it's like communism. It's a system, it's an intended system that they're going to force their will on you. They're going to force it on you whether you want it or not. And we're going to talk about that a little bit, but what they're using right now is they're using economics and the power of the dollar and consumerism to, to force globalism onto everybody. And real quickly, what globalism is, at least by my definition, is globalism is the free and unimpeded movement of ideas, 
people, money, and goods across the international borders. Now, most Americans, most people in this room have, were raised on a, on a term that really isn't what it sounds like. And that's called free trade. You hear it all the time. And how it, it's amazing. The communists thought communism would bring us to utopia. And the neoconservatives think free trade will bring us to utopia. And neither one of them will. America was not a nation which was born and raised on free trade. That is, that is such a misstatement of fact. It's almost not possible to believe that somebody can say that and get away with it over and over again. But it proves the point that if you lie enough and say it enough, people will listen to it. In, I mean, most of the people in this room, if you're native-born Texan, it means by definition you're native-born Southerner. If you're native-born Southerner, then you know that one of the reasons that we seceded in 1861, and I say we because my family comes from North Carolina, we seceded was because the federal government was being financed by one portion of the nation, us, through one system, tariffs. That's not free trade, that's protectionism. And they used it to do two different things, to tax cotton grown in the South going out, and to tax goods coming in to raise the price so that it cost at least as much as the stuff built in the North. And what that did was, it protected the northern industries, and so they were able to grow up and prosper and build the America that eventually happened. But you never hear people talk about the positives of protectionism. They never tell you that. It's in the history books. If I'm lying, somebody can take me out and shoot me right now. But it's right there to go read if you want to read it. That's how the northern industrial base was built by protectionism, not of everything. They didn't protect everything. They selected industries that they wanted to grow, and then they created protectionist tariffs and embargoes around things so that that industry could survive and grow. Guess who does that today? China and Brazil. Oh, wait a minute. What about this globalism and free and unpeated st stuff crossing the border? Not in those two countries. How about Japan? How about Japan when they, when they build Hondas in America to sell to Americans, how many Fords do you think you see over there? Not because they won't sell, because they can't get in. You can't bring them in the country to sell them, therefore nobody can buy them. You see, we were, and, and, and the reason we're doing this, and, and kids, I want to talk to you, I, the, the, the after 75 crowd, or before 75 crowd probably understands it. When we were engaged in the Cold War, we were the leader of the free world. And when you're a leader, when you're a real leader, you have to make sacrifices. You don't just walk around bossing everybody and tell them, I want this and I want that and I want this. That's not what Christ did. Christ gave up his life so that we could be something. When you're the leader, you give up. And so America gave things to the world to rebuild it, like the Marshall Plan and a bunch of other things, so that they could rebuild it. And what we did was we sold off a portion of the American marketplace to the rest of the world so they could sell to us, earn some money, and build their countries up. At the time, it made sense in a strategic sense in a competition with a system that was out to kill us. It makes no sense to do that now because, A, we are not leader of the free world. We are now one of 188 countries trying to survive like everybody else. And so we don't have to give up our stuff so the people in Africa can eat. And I don't mean that against anybody. What I'm saying is, I'll do, I'll do it. I'll give five cents if you give five cents and you give five cents and Japan gives five cents and Saudi Arabia gives five cents and Sweden gives five cents and Egypt gives five cents. I'll do it. But I won't do it just by, for me and everybody else do whatever you want to do. We're done with that. And that's the problem. Some party, and I don't know if it's going to be the Republican Party, 
And I may be wrong. There may be people sitting out there saying, Mark, you're just wrong. I'm sorry. That's fine. I'm wrong. If that's the way you feel about it, great. You heard my say, and be the way you want to be. But what I'm telling you is that when Obama ran against Romney, Obama defined his America. He said what America should be to him. And he got 50.1% or whatever he got in order to get elected. I never heard Romney tell me what America should be. I never heard him tell me, if you're president of the United States, what is going to be your priority? Now, he said jobs. That's fine. Go to the next step. How are you going to do that? Now, Obama did say jobs. Obama said, oh, the government will hire you. And if the government doesn't hire you, I'll give you a grant and you can go to college or a loan. And then if you go to college and you can't get hired, I'll give you another loan to go to another college. <laughs> I mean, that's basically what he's doing. And if you still don't get a job, I'll give you food stamps and maybe a phone, an Obama phone, and do whatever you want to do. I mean, the point is that when people looked at him as a candidate, he had a plan. It stank. It was a terrible plan. It's not American, but he had a plan. The other guy stands up and says, you know, I'll give you a perfect example. And everything I say, first of all, when I talk specifics, I'm not lying. I'm not saying something that I made up. If you go to Google, put in Congressional Research Service, Congressional Research Service, and put gas and oil and Google it, what you'll get, if you look through that, is a report done by Congress. Do you know which nation has the most energy reserves in the world? Right here. Right here. We spend $500 billion, let me say that again, $500 billion a year buying foreign oil, supposing we bought, turned that right around, and bought American oil. Now, instead of having a $500 billion trade deficit, we would have $500 billion going into the United States. That doesn't seem like a really hard decision. And I thought when Romney talked at the Republican National Convention that when he said we would be energy independent, that was his goal. I thought that's what he was saying. But then I continued to listen to him, and in his later speeches he said North American energy independence. That's not American, that's Mexico and Canada. Once again, our money going to countries that ain't us for oil that we could have right here. You see what I'm saying? It's, this is not hard. This is not, this is not calculus. This is basic math. And, I, and I'm probably aggravating a lot of people here, but I'm trying to get, to be honest with everybody in the room, you know who my real audience is? Because they're the ones that's going to have to do it, and they're the ones that's going to have to think about this. We're obviously not getting there. We're not having the impact that we need to have. And I'll take the hit more than anybody else in this room. But something's got to change or we're going down the toilet. And I don't mean down the toilet like we'll be bankrupt in depression. What I'm talking about is I think, and, and I don't know where you come from on this, but I think God created the United States as man's third chance. Adam and Eve had Eden. Then we got Christ. And now we have America. We can either be the city on the hill. We can be the model of what the world should be, but not impose it, not demand it, not dictate it, not walk around and tell people, oh, you're Islam, that's bad, get out of here. No, you be Islam, I'll be Christian, we'll see who survives better. We'll see who lives better, we'll see who's happier, we'll see who's kinder, we'll see who gets to heaven. But I'm not going to wipe out Islam. You know, we went from a country that before World War II didn't go around telling people how to live. Now we think because we were the leader of the free world, we're allowed to go around and tell countries how they got to be. Crap, that's garbage. First of all, it takes a lot of money to do that. Second of all, you really think that you have a right to tell somebody else how to live? I don't. See, the, and that's why I'm saying the Republican Party, it's just, you know, they, you listen to the talk show host, well, we, gotta, we have to get more blacks, but we have to get more Hispanics, but we have to get more women, we have to, no, we don't have to get any more of nothing. What we have to do is we have to figure out who we are. 
who do we want this country to be? And then present it and say, is this what you want or do you want that? Make a choice. But the choices are a lot harder. Now, I gotta get to, I don't know how much time I got. Oh shoot, I'm almost out of time. <laughs> well, I did all of this to get you to a point that's gonna, this is the point that I'm worried about in the talk because you may either not believe me or you may, it may scare the heck out of you. Or you might say, Mark, you went really good till you got to that point and don't ever come back here. There's a term that's being used called the New World Order. And that New World Order is a code word term for one world government. And the, and the problem we have here, I, I, I want to, um, if you've been, if you're taking any notes, and, and what I'm going to tell you, you I, don't write it down if you don't have it, if you forget it, if you can send me an email, and I'll give you the email address at the end, I can send you where to find what I'm going to tell you. There was a man named Major Bart Kessler, United States Air Force, who wrote a paper titled, Bush's New World Order, What Do the Words Really Mean? He wrote that paper at the United States Air Force Commanding General Staff College in 1997. And in that paper, he laid out in 61 pages exactly, and I have that paper with me if you want to see it, but I'm keeping it. Um, but in that paper, he laid out what George Bush the I meant when he talked about the New World Order. And what he meant was a one world government. And in that paper, he lays out that there are three different ways to get to a one world government. One way is for the United Nations to get an expansion of authority. One of those ways could be taxation. A second way is that the United Nations will use functionalism to take authority over certain things. Functionalism. For example, we're the United Nations, the internet goes around the world, therefore it's ours. Or the space is all around the world, therefore it's ours. Or you probably heard about the Treaty of the Seas. Seas are all around the world, therefore it's ours. And so the United Nations won't take over everything at once. It'll just take over pieces of things. And then the third way to do it is to, um, is to create super states. The European Union is the example of a super state. If you look at the European Union, even Napoleon, back in 1800, looked towards having a United States of Europe. That was actually what he was trying to create. And there, once the Cold War ended, that possibility actually all of a sudden, hey, we could do this. We could actually create a United States of Europe. And that's what they're working towards. Fortunately, from my view, it ain't working so good. And maybe its own failure will slow down this movement towards a world and world government. I want to um, I, I wanna go, but I want, I, I mean, I, don't, I got some other things I want to tell you, but I forgot to do what I wanted to do at the very beginning of this, um, which was before I, before I came, I read a verse in the Bible, not, not even a complete verse, that I wanted to start to talk with. But maybe now is when God wanted it to be said. And it reads, quote, the Lord confused the speech of all the world. It was from that place that he scattered them all over the world. Genesis 11, 9. In other words, if you, if, if you know where that came from, it comes from the story of the Tower of Babel. And at that point in time, everybody spoke the same language. Everybody was the same nation. We were all the same. And they, and they migrated towards the east, and they built this city called Shinar, and they said, hey, why don't we all get together and we're going to build a tower that goes all the way up to God. And so they started building and they, and they were building it and God came down and visited the city and he said, you know, if they build that tower, they'll think they can do anything. And that's when he decided to confuse the language, create the nations and spread everybody out. Now, if God chose to spread everybody out, are we going against God by trying to bring everybody together? Yes. 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 And that's, I mean, and I, that question is a dangerous question. I'm not, I got to tell you, I'm the only, and you're not going to like what I'm going to tell you now, so you're probably not going to like it. 
When, when America was going to go into Iraq and invade Iraq, I was on the executive committee, the GOP executive committee of Upshur County, Texas. I was the only man in the room to vote against it. I voted against it because from the Vietnam era, I learned Americans aren't real good at wars of colonization. We don't do real good at wars that last 10 years, don't ever seem to end, and we don't seem to be doing anything except getting people killed. And so I voted against it because I figured America would tire out, and we are tired out. Once, once we went, uh, as an old soldier, there's no choice. Once America commits, once the first bullet is fired, then that's it. We're in a fight, we're going to win, and that's it. There's no discussion after that. It's just about how to win. But before the decision's made is when you, got, when you should say your piece, if you're going to say it. And so all I'm saying is in that is that I'm not, I'm not a military guy. I don't believe in going around conquering the world. I don't believe in constant fights. I wish there was a way to create world peace, but I don't think there is. I think there's things we could do as a nation to help people maybe live peacefully, but I don't think trying to dictate it is going to work. No. So anyway, um, this, new, this, this new world order thing, that, that paper, that 61 pages by Major Bart Kessler, let me finish on him. You know, when I read that paper, the, front, the very first, because it's very specific. This paper, if you read this paper, it's going to knock your socks off because it's very, very specific, and it calls names. It cites George Bush, the president. And it says, let me read to you. I, I haven't read much to you, but this I want to read to you. This is in the paper. I'm almost done, Pat, wherever it's you are. Okay. Oh. We are a very patient group of people who like to listen and be educated. Okay, Kessler writes, well, first of all, Kessler quotes um, George Bush's speech. In his conclusion, Major Kessler states that a means of transferring American sovereignty to the United Nations will be through either a permanent or lengthy assignment of a U.S. rapid deployment force to complete control of the United Nations. In other words, he would take a core or some, and that's about 30,000 men, give it to the United Nations and say, use it the way you want to use it. We'll pay for it, you use it. He states that one signal or code word for the transfer of national power to the United Nations will be to change the words national interest to common vital interests, as used in Pre President Bush's towards a new world order speech to Congress. Consequently, as the UN grows in strength, we, this, is, this is Kessler, consequently as the UN grows in strength, we will likely experience increased United States military operations supporting more ambiguous missions. I'll give you an example, Afghanistan. Kessler states, quote, now this is important, this is the one that knocked my socks off. It is therefore an American interest to see an end to nationhood as it has been historically defined. In other words, what Kessler says is that the President of the United States the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, and those people in power in the United States are working to give up our nation. Now that was written in 1997. Those were Clinton years. But in my belief of this theory, it starts with Bush 1 and goes Bush, Clinton, Bush, Obama. It runs that straight along. Now, it's important because, you know, when, when you think politically, it's kind of it's, it's like a poker game. You've you got to know what the other guy's trying to do. And I think, whether it's Republican or Democrat, and whether it's the leader or a part of the leadership, what they're trying to do is attain that goal, and that is give up the United States. And so when we talk about this fiscal cliff, for example, you know, how are we going to resolve this fiscal cliff? My thought, when I, my first thought when I think about the fiscal cliff is, how does that work towards their goal of giving us up to the United Nations? That's the way I conceive of that problem. 
I don't conceive of it as, oh, well, we'll have a depression, or oh, well, Social Security checks will stop, or oh, well, it's not about that. It's not about that. This is about the goal that President George Bush said. Now, some people in the room could say, well, wait a minute, Mark. Now, Major Kessler was only a major, which for those of you that served in the military, you know that's kind of like halfway up. You start as a lieutenant, you get to a general, major's right in the middle. So he's not that important. And not only that, big deal, he wrote a paper. You know, they he wrote that, they read it, they probably threw him out. Wrong. They promoted him to lieutenant colonel. You know what, it, you know what his job was between 2002 and 2005? He was teaching at the United States Air Force Command and General Staff College five years after he wrote that, and they read it. He was teaching the men that rise through the ranks to go to general. Hmm, is that an accident? They read this, he's crazy, but we don't care, we'll make him a teacher anyway. I don't think that's true. I think they used him in order to spread this. And all I'm saying to you folks is, I'll use the beginning of the talk that I never said to you for the end of the talk. I believe that when, when God created Adam and Eve, and when he put them out of the Garden of Eden, he didn't make them slaves, and he didn't make them peons to a king. They were equals, and they were in charge of themselves, and, and everything grew out of that, which tells me that God wants us to be free, and he wants us to be the people who govern ourselves. That's what I get out of it. I'm not a preacher. I didn't go to no theological school. I'm just telling you how I read it. And what I'm saying is, by you spending this hour or whatever it is to be in this room to think about and talk about what's going on in your nation is exactly what God wanted and exactly what George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and the list is endless, wanted when they created the United States of America. The unfortunate thing in our country is we spend, we'll, we'll put in our book three hours for the Cowboys on Sunday. We'll put in our book eight to five at work, Monday through Friday. But who puts in their book two hours this week for citizenship? Two hours this week to my country. And I'm not talking about volunteering to clean the road. I'm not talking about you know, joining a civic group. I'm talking about this, what we're doing right now. As citizens in this nation, thinking about what our future should be. You are, you are a blessing to me, but you are an example to these guys of what Americans are supposed to be and aren't. And so for today, I really appreciate the time. I hope I didn't bore you. If I ticked you off, please don't hit me because I had two brain tumors. If you hit me, I'll probably drop. <laughs> That's it. First of all, there aren't, any, there aren't too many communist countries left out there that are actually threatening people. There are places in the world that we could be helpful, but my, my point is it's kind of like your house is on fire and your neighbor's house is on fire. Whose do you take care of? Okay, I'm not saying, I basically, if I, if I had to answer this question, I'll tell you this. I went to the Citadel, I spent nine years in the Army, and I have never spoken to a person since 1991 where I encouraged them to go in the military. Reason being is, if you're not defending America, you're in the wrong job. And right now, those people are not defending America. You know, when September 11th happened, I was in New York on September 11th. I worked in the government for a senator in September 11th. My wife worked for a congressman. We lost people in that attack. But my reaction to September 11th would have never been invade another country. It would have been James Bond. 
It would have been, get the CIA together, call the boys together, we got a hit to make. That's what it should have been. It's a lot less expensive and a lot more effective. Yes, ma'am. How much different would we be if the Cold World War did not happen? Well, that's a great question. I don't know who asked that one. That was uh, team pack kid. Wow, that's some heavy question. If there had not been a Cold War, I, I, I really don't know how that wouldn't have happened because the Soviet Union, if, if you study it enough, and you know the great thing that they have that we don't, I'm a historian, I love history. I mean, Dave Pearson knows. I mean, I re, and, but, but the longer you study history, the more you want to throw out all the books that were written after the history happened. You want to read the people that actually were there. You want to, like for me, I'm a Civil War historian. I like to read Raphael Sims. I like to read Robert E. Lee's son. I like to read Henry Kidd Douglas. I want to read the people who were there. The, 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 the advantage that you have that we didn't have is you can actually see the television footage of Nikita Khrushchev at the United Nations taking his shoe off and hitting the table, we will crush you. We will crush you. On television, hitting his shoe on the table. He said it, I didn't. You can see it. The difference, so I don't know how to answer that question because I, I don't do well at speculating on history that didn't happen. <laughs> I can only do on history that did, and that happened. I'm sorry if I'm burning up. President Obama wants to take the United States to a nuclear-free status. Can he actually do that? Should he? He can do it and he shouldn't. Um, he can't do it unilaterally, I think, but you can't tell. Where we're at right now, and, and what's really scary for me, and I don't know about for you, is like we're hearing a lot about the problem I have, and let's go back to in answering this question, Remember that your focus has to stay on somebody is trying to give up the United States and put it in the UN. Remember that as the starting point of every question. When we hear about executive office orders, the, the president's given this executive order, the president's given that executive order, it kind of sounds like we got a dictator and Congress doesn't count. The, the question I have is, and only Louis Gomer and Ted Cruz and those guys can answer the question is, is he getting away with it? Is he actually giving executive orders that actually change laws, and are, is he bypassing you, and is he actually doing it? That would be my number one question to them if I saw him. And if they answer no, then I really wouldn't worry too much about what Obama says. If they answer yes, then I'm starting to think about secession. Then I'm starting to think about it's time to leave. Because that's not the Constitution, and if we're not going to play by the deck of the rules, then I'm leaving. I don't know how to answer it better than that. Where am I going? Right here. We create our own country, and when the Yankees invade, don't fight them. Let them come in. Let them, let them bring their tanks in. Let them sit right there and look at you. And who's paying the bill for it? How long you, how long you think they'll do that? How long will they sit in Texas and occupy you, getting absolutely no money and no taxes, and you're not shooting at them, and they can't shoot at you, and you just sit there? Eventually, they're going to leave, because they want to go home and see mom. You know, what the mistake in 61 wasn't leaving, it was fighting. In 61, they should have just said, we're a new country. If you want to come in and sit around, sit around. Have a good day. Bye. Have you seen the movie Agenda? And if so, the film thesis is the U.S. is being overrun from the inside by socialists and communists. How do you think this is related to China? I didn't see the movie. I don't think China has anything to do with it as far as Agenda. Agenda 21, which I think Agenda plays off of, Agenda 21 you can find on the internet. You only need to Google it, Agenda 21. It will take you right to the United Nations site. You can read everything about it. It is impacting on the United States. It is having a direct effect. Are socialists behind Agenda 21? You're asking me a question I really don't know anything about. What I will tell you is internationalists are behind Agenda 21. And if they happen to be socialists too, that's just part of it. Do Americans still think our oceans are sufficient to protect us from Europe, the Mideast, and Asia? Americans don't. I do. We've been fed so much faulty information that we believe what we're told. Like I said before, if you say something enough times, people will believe it. So what they did was they said, well, you know, we're in a different time. And, and, and they built the argument 
to support our opposition to the Soviet Union by focusing on the nuclear bomb threat. Ronald Reagan blew that to pieces when he said we should have a shield, when he said we could actually defend ourselves against nuclear weapons. And if that shield were in place, the oceans would be more than enough to defend us from everybody but Canada and Mexico, which we don't seem to be able to close our own border, so I don't know that Europe, and we, I don't know we have to be afraid of Europe and them, because Mexico's doing it without us having, you know. So um, that's my answer to that question. We should seal our border with Mexico. All right. Have you read the book, The Number of Man, by Philip Morrow? You have described it right on. Nope, didn't read it. Don't know him. I just do my own thing. What are your thoughts on Benghazi? Well, first of all, that, uh, that's, to me, that's an impeachable offense. Yes. Yes. You know, you got to wonder, sometimes, I mean, I was, I was in politics for 10 years. I, I worked, actually, 15 years. And I mean, I got paid to be an aide to an elected official. That's what my job was. I got paid to help run the government. And I learned a lot of things when I, when I was in that job. And one of them was that does a, does a politician make a speech, and then when he goes in the office, does he do things which manifest, which are what he just talked about? Yeah. Now, I want to know why Ted Cruz and Cornyn haven't filed a bill of impeachment. Where is it? Because this doesn't make any sense to me that, you know, I don't know if you know about this. I don't know if it's... A four-star general named General Ham, who was commander of the Africa Command, ordered a rescue mission into that area and was relieved within 30 seconds of the time he gave the order. It's an impeachable offense. What is your advice to what we should do about the problem? Well, we're doing it. Um, but part of it is we're doing it, we're meeting like this. Part of it is we have to talk and learn. Part of it is we have to commit a certain amount of time to being a citizen. And I'm not talking about working for the Red Cross or going out and picking up litter. I'm talking about learning about what we as citizens are supposed to know. And it's a lot of stuff. Being a citizen in a free country is tough. It is hard work. It takes a lot of time. And it's easy for me to say do it because I don't have, my job is what I'm doing right now. Sometimes I get paid, most of the time I don't, I'm very poor. <laughs> Doesn't matter. But most people have real jobs and have real work and they can't do everything that it takes. But what I'm telling you is if we don't commit more time as to, as to our citizenship and to being Americans, there won't be Americans much longer. Do you think our country would have been better off if another candidate than Romney would have run for Sarah the Palin. Ah. <laughs> this comes from our membership, sir. You are a great speaker. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.